Take a piece of string, hold each end with your fingers, and let it dangle freely. What's the shape that it takes? It looks a bit like a parabola, but it turns out that it's something different. From electric lines to spider webs, any cable that we suspend at the ends and allow to hang under its own weight can be described mathematically by a catenary. Using only introductory calculus and some basic physics, let's derive the formula for a catenary. So here's our string, and let's think of it as a curve in the xy plane, but we're going to leave the origin undetermined for now and come back to that later. So let's label a couple points. We'll call this middle point where the tangent line is horizontal, point C, and we'll call a general point on the string as R. And our goal is to write R as actually Y, a function of X. Um, but for now, we are going to parametrize it by a parameter S, so we'll write R is equal to X of S, Y of S. And we want to do this in such a way that the velocity vector, dr ds, is of unit length so that we can write it as cosine of phi, sine of phi for some angle phi. And it's actually always possible to find such a parametrization. And this works if we let s be the arc length of the curve. Then we get the unit tangent vector like we want. So let's zoom in on the part of the string just from c to r and take a look at the forces that are acting on it. We have, first of all, the weight which I'll write as W, that's the force of gravity acting vertically downwards on the string. We have a tension force, TC, acting in the negative X direction at point C. And at R, we have another tension force, TR, which acts at the angle phi. So what does it mean for the string to be at rest? It means that it's at static equilibrium. So that means that the sum of the forces acting on the string is zero. So breaking this out into components, we have that TC is equal to minus T naught zero, where T naught is some positive number. And we can write the weight as zero minus lambda GS, where lambda is the mass per unit length and G is the acceleration due to gravity. And you can check for yourself that this does give us the right units for a force. And finally, we have that TR is equal to T cosine phi, T sine phi, where T is the magnitude of the tension. Looking first at the X component, we see that minus T naught plus T cosine phi equals zero, or T cosine phi is equal to T naught. For the Y component, we have minus lambda GS plus T sine phi is equal to zero, or t sine phi is equal to lambda gs. So in these two equations, we have the independent variable s, but we have two dependent variables, t and phi. And so we would like to get rid of one of those. So we can do that by dividing. If we divide the bottom equation by the top one, we eliminate t and we find that tangent of phi is equal to lambda gs over t naught. So there's a lot of constants floating around in this expression. So let's go ahead and combine them all into one. We'll define A to be T naught over lambda G. And so then we have S arc length is equal to A tangent of phi. Now let's examine DX D phi and DY D phi. Using the chain rule, we can write DX D phi as DX DS times DS D phi. And from the way we parametrized the string, we know that dx ds is cosine of phi, and now we can calculate that ds d phi is a secant squared of phi. So we find that dx d phi is a secant phi. Now for dy d phi, using the chain rule, that's dy ds times ds d phi. And from the parametrization, that's sine phi times a secant squared of phi, which gives us a tan phi secant phi. Now we have a pair of differential equations that we would like to solve for x and y, and then hopefully find out how they're related to each other. Of these two, y is easier, so we'll do that one first. y is going to be the integral of a tangent phi secant phi d phi, 
which as you might remember from calculus, is a secant phi, but we do need to add an arbitrary constant of integration, c1. x is going to be a little trickier, but still doable. If you don't remember this integral off the top of your head, you can find it by multiplying by 1 in a clever way. We'll multiply by secant phi plus tangent phi over secant phi plus tangent phi. And then distributing this, we get secant squared phi plus secant phi tangent phi on the top. And we notice that that first term is d by d phi of tangent phi. And the second term is d by d phi of secant phi. So if you're thinking of this in terms of a u substitution, that means that we have du over u. So we'll get a logarithm out of it. And in fact, x is equal to a natural log of secant phi plus tangent phi. And again, we need a constant of integration. So what do c1 and c2 represent? They actually correspond to changing where the origin is located. And since we didn't define the origin yet, we can just set them both equal to zero without loss of generality. This will simplify the calculations and the result will still describe the catenary that we want. So now we have equations for x and y in terms of phi. And to get y as a function of x, we'll first need to find secant of phi in terms of x. So taking the expression for x, we can divide by a and exponentiate to see that e to the x over a is secant of phi plus tangent of phi. Now we'd like to get another equation out of this in order to eliminate tangent of phi. And it turns out that a good way to do that will be to take the multiplicative inverses. Now, 1 over e to the x over a is e to the minus x over a, but it's not as clear what we get for 1 over secant phi plus tangent phi. So let's take a look at that. Writing it in terms of sine and cosine, we see there's this cosine that can go up on top, and then we multiply by 1 in the form of 1 minus sine phi over 1 minus sine phi and we get on the top cosine phi times 1 minus sine phi, on the bottom 1 minus sine squared phi, which is cosine squared phi. And so the first term is 1 over cosine phi, the second term is minus sine phi over cosine phi, and that is equivalent to secant phi minus tangent phi. And this is really useful, because now we have a second equation, e to the minus x over a, is equal to secant phi minus tangent of phi, and we can add this to our other equation, and the tangents will cancel out. So we'll just have e to the x over a plus e to the minus x over a is equal to 2 secant of phi. Or secant of phi is equal to 1 half e to the x over a plus e to the minus x over a, which you might recognize as the hyperbolic cosine of x over a. And if you don't recognize what a hyperbolic cosine is, don't worry about it. You can just think of it in terms of these exponentials. So we finally have what we need. y is equal to a secant phi, or a times the hyperbolic cosine of x over a. And that is the formula for the catenary. Now let's think about what this a represents. Remember that a is t naught over lambda g where lambda is mass per unit length of the string, so a physical characteristic of the string, g is the acceleration due to gravity, so a property of the planet that we're on, and t naught is the tension at the center point, which is going to depend on physical characteristics of the string and also where we place the endpoints. So we see that once we have a particular string and define a pair of endpoints, the catenary is uniquely defined, which is what we want. As a final thought, it's important to note that the model that we use to derive the catenary formula is idealized. In particular, the assumption that the string is completely uniform is not necessarily accurate. As a result, the match between our calculated model and this real string is good but not perfect. This is a simple example showing that a model is only as good as its assumptions. Most of the time, making fewer assumptions has the drawback of making the calculations more difficult but it tends to yield a model that better reflects the physical world.